Good evening and welcome. My name is Jeanette Perez Rossello. I am a class of 1991 from the College of Human Ecology. I am currently a pediatric radiologist at Children's Boston um, Hospital, and I am also an associate um, instructor in radiology at Harvard Medical School. Welcome to this evening's feature event, The Value of Leadership in the 21st Century. A special welcome to the Cornelians that are joining us via Facebook. Tonight's event is brought to you by Cornell Mosaic and the President's Council for Cornell Women, where I serve as a steering committee member. We are in for an engaging panel discussion. Five fabulous Cornell women that are in the business of helping others see what is going on around the world. Before we get started, I would like to point out that we will not be taking questions from the floor audience. Uh, this is to respect our time constraints. However, all of you will have the opportunity to interact with the panelists during the reception. For the Twitter and live stream audience, we will select a few questions that you can submit by using the hashtag CornellCalc. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Kate Snow, a fellow 1991 classmate. Uh, uh, she is a graduate from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences with a degree in communication. Kate is a correspondent for the Rock Center with Brian Williams. She's a former correspondent for Dateline NBC. And Kat, Kat, Kate continues to serve as a filling anchor for NBC Nightly News. She contributes to all platforms of NBC News. And throughout her career, Kate has covered breaking news, stories that affect parents and children, politics, presidential elections, White House Congress, and many others. So welcome, Kate, and welcome to all the panelists. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Can we get a little shout out for ALS out there? Can we get a little, little, little egg? Thank you, thank you. Because everybody up here on the stage with me, they're all arts. Yeah. <laughs> Yay, art! See, I, I knew that was gonna happen. Uh, I'm gonna introduce the panel real quick just so we all know uh, who we are. And, and then we'll start right in with questions. We wanted to get right into it. But on my right, on your left, is Essie Cup. She's a 2000 graduate. She is the youngest of us up here. Uh, she's the author of Losing Our Religion, The Liberal Media's Attack on Christianity, also the co-author of Why You're Wrong About the Right. She has a regular column that you may know about in the New York Daily News, and she's a contributing editor at Town Hall Magazine, also a regular contributor to Politico's Arena. Big TV commentator, if you watch, hopefully you watch MSNBC, but if you watch <laughs> CNN or Fox or any of them, you've seen Essie. Uh, she's all over the place. Right here to my right is Cheryl Wu Dunn. Uh, she is the first Asian American reporter to ever win a Pulitzer Prize, which I think is a pretty darn big deal. She is also, she's known for a lot of things. Uh, by the way, no slackers up here. I'm just saying, not myself, but these four. Um, Cheryl is the best-selling author of Half the Sky, which is a great book. She's a business executive. She's a lecturer. Currently, she's a senior managing director at Midmarket Securities and president of Triple Edge, which is a social investing consultancy. She's also a member of the Cornell University Board of Trustees. She's co-chaired the Academic Affairs Committee, former member of the University Endowments Investment Committee, and a member of the board's finance committee. So she's done just a little bit for Cornell over the years. Uh, all these folks. To my left is another Cheryl Tucker. Cheryl Tucker is class of 78, uh, award-winning business journalist, publishing executive. Uh, she's helped investors, corporate professionals, and companies build wealth, advance careers, grow philanthropy. That's been a big mission of hers, specifically helping people that have a lot of money finding, find interesting ways to give it away, which is, I'm sure a lot of people in this room would like to see people invest in Cornell, so she's helping with that. She's also currently serving as a consultant uh, to the Time Warner Foundation. So that's your, your big mission right now, is serving as a consultant to Time Warner on issues of philanthropy. She's also a trustee 
uh, and chair of Mosaic, which you heard was sponsoring the event tonight. And then to my far left is Kathy Merrill Williams, 91, just like me. Kathy is owner. With it, was there applause out there for 91? <laughs> no, all right. Um, Kathy is owner and publisher of Washingtonian Magazine Incorporated. If you live in D.C., you know exactly what that is. It's the media company that includes Washingtonian Magazine, one of my favorite magazines, uh, leading monthly here in Washington. They have more than 300,000 readers. Also, the popular local website, Washingtonian.com, Washingtonian Bride and Groom, Washingtonian, Cust <laughs> Washingtonian Custom Media, and Washingtonian Events. They've got a whole thing going on. She is active in the community. She sits on six outside boards. She chairs two of those. She's a lifelong Washingtonian, lives in the district here with her husband and two kids. I think several of us have kids up here. We're moms as well. So that's our panel. And I want to start right in. I was trying to think about how to frame this. These, these women are all thought leaders. They're all leaders in their fields. And that's probably why you're here. And I wanted to start really big picture, since you're all successful leaders, and you've all worked in media, you're all sort of synthesizing the issues of the day and telling people what to think about. Essie, I'm going to start with you, and I want to go down the row. When we talk about leadership, and this is a big, broad question, but where do you see the biggest failure of leadership today? Mm. <clears throat> well, first, hello, and thanks for having me, and thanks for coming. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, because I do speak for a living, my voice is going, I apologize. <laughs> we haven't if even it, started if yet. If it gets grating, <laughs> I know. Um, if it cracks, I'm not getting emotional. I'm just, it's going. But uh, yeah, because I cover politics, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll look to the current situation and, and say, without trying to get too partisan here, um, we don't need to, to fight, but uh, I think the failure on the part of this administration, and frankly, the administration before, before it, to address our economic issues in an effective and lasting way, uh, I think has been the greatest failure of leadership that has affected all of us in every sector. Um, and <clears throat> if you look back to the genesis of this economic collapse with Fannie and Freddie and that, the housing market, which, which started out as government influence over, over housing. I think it's a huge mistake that the last administration and this administration continues to exert government influence over so many aspects of our lives. Um, and, and again, this is not an Obama thing. Bush did it as well. I think this culture that we live in, whether it's Hollywood, the media is to blame, and certainly a lot of our political leaders have not remembered that we are a culture that should inspire personal responsibility and self-reliance. Those are not values that I think are being fostered by a lot of leadership right now. And, and that's unfortunate. We should be in positions to take care of ourselves. I mean, you know, we worked hard. We got where we got because we worked hard at it. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we might have gotten some mentorship here and there, but I didn't get any handouts. I'm sure you didn't either. And I think, you know, we, we sit back and we wonder why, um, you know, kids grow up so lazy these days. And they are. They are so lazy. Um, well, the cultural around them really fosters that. And I think um, more personal responsibility in, in every aspect of our of our, of our universe, our political universe and our media universe, I think would go a long way to solving so many uh, of our issues. Go ahead, jump in, Kathy. I, I, don't, I mean, I, I really don't think the kids are lazy. I think that, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't. I think, I think most people here who interact with Cornell students don't think that. We have a lot of young kids that come through, through our office that work for us. We have intern programs three times a year. I have a lot of young, people on the staff who work really, really hard. Now, certain, uh, there's certain y young students who have a sense of entitlement to what they yeah. want in a job. Uh, fortunately, the economy has fixed a lot of that. Uh, I, I mean, what? 
What I saw five years ago <laughs> is very different than what I see now, but I see people who graduate with a lot of debt, who work hard, who take extra jobs. I don't think that, ha that has fundamentally changed at all. People might want foosball tables and ping pong and all of this sort of stuff in their, in their work atmosphere, but I disagree with you. I think the biggest failure of, of leadership is that uh, we have too many people who put party over country. And that is the fundamental problem right now in our system. You know, I think actually if you want to look at what leadership means, um, uh, at least from the country's point of view, I think we can look at it from the political, from the military, and from the economic point of view. We used to have uh, leadership in all three fronts. And I think that that is waning partly because we started taking things for granted. Uh, we went too far out on the military front and we are setting a terrible example uh, for the rest of the world and we see the implications for all of that because of the two wars that we're, that we're playing. So I think uh, that is an issue. And then on the economic front, I think it, 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 we were dealt a bad hand. I think it was very difficult to uh, uh, put particular blame on the political leaders because you know, they, uh, they actually had to clean up this mess that uh, you know, was a result of a number of conspiring factors. But I do think that there has been uh, you know, uh, sort of a, a falling uh, out of the kind of leadership that should uh, actually uh, 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 have taken better uh, care uh, in, in stewarding the, the, the economic leadership. And we have this issue now in Europe where we aren't taking any, we really are taking a backstage and because we just don't know what to do. And I think that partly it raises the question of, is there a systemic problem? Is the way we function in the government, is there something wrong with it? Because the two parties can't you know, work together. Uh, there's you know, static stasis in the, in the government. There's nothing, nothing is operating very well. So I think people are asking the question, is there something in the way our system is, is organized that we have to change now because it was set up 200 years ago and it's not appropriate for now? But then I also want to say, even though we're criticizing all this, what would you do in those circumstances if you were in these leadership roles? It's not easy. And so I think it's, while we on one, on one hand, we'd like to criticize, if you were to put yourself in the shoes either of Obama, you know, of Ben Bernanke, you know, or, or of other people, do you really think that you could do a better job? It's not easy. John it's Kano. humbling, in fact. I have a challenge with not only our political leadership, but as a business journalist, um, in my vantage point of, of when I was an executive editor at Money or when I was the editor-in-chief of Black Enterprise, looking at the way that the uh, business leaders make decisions, whether or not they really make sense in, in a long term. We watched the financial meltdown a few uh, years ago and we realized that a lot of things were built on, on, on uh, policies and programs and products that were not built to last. They were definitely short-term kind of solutions to make money in a fast way and there was a, a sense of accountability of what would happen. Our, and as a covering that, you would see these products come out and you would see many of them that brought down some of the greatest institutions in our country in terms of financial, you know, financial companies. And you knew that they were you know, bogus from the, from the very beginning. But what were the ethical issues or values that um, were discussed in those boardrooms as they created these products and offered them and gave them uh, to um, organizations, uh, individuals, countries that would never be able to afford them. So this was not anything that should have been a surprise. And so it's, for me, one of the things that we need to really hold our leaders accountable is how they make decisions, their ethics and the values behind some of the decisions that are made. But you're talking about corporate America, right? I'm, I'm talking about all decisions. I, I agree with what everybody's saying, that that's as much important as our legislative leaders as well as our business leaders um, or our policy leaders. It doesn't really make a difference, but we need to think about how we make decisions and the impact of them, not just for our current use, but going forward. How do you force that to happen, though, for example, in a corporate boardroom where money and profit is really the driving force? That's a challenge. That's, that's a true challenge when you have this, the cycles. I think that in some ways the, um, the organizations that were set to cover them, whether it's the media, whether it's policy makers, whether it's organizational leaders uh, that are watchdogs for those organizations, really kind of let the American people down in that, where we did not really uh, put uh, the feet to the fire when some of these things came out, these decisions. 
there was kind of like a lot of people talking to each other about them, but I'm not sure we really helped everyone else understand some of the pitfalls that were going to happen if it continued that way. Okay, plug for women, a plug for women. So um, I know I'm borrowing and stealing from other people, but um, it has been said that if Lehman Brothers, the board of Lehman Brothers, or if the name of the company was Lehman Brothers and Sisters, that maybe right. <laughs> there would have been actually a more diversity of opinion on the board, and they would not have uh, you know, made some of the decisions that they did. So I was going to ask you, because you work in investment banking now. Uh, you've been a writer. You worked for the New York Times for a long time. You won a Pulitzer Prize, but you now are in investment banking, right? So as you view the world, is good leadership rewarded by Wall Street? Is good, le is is good, good leadership, leadership on rewarded. Wall Street rewarded? Um, I'd say that it's really the profit motive. I mean, it really, I mean, there are great leaders, people who are great <laughs> managers on Wall Street, I have to say. Um, but that's because the goals that they are given is that they have to, you know, enhance shareholder value. And so with that in mind, I think that was a lot of the issues related to what happened in the, in the crash uh, in 2008 is that they were very short-term oriented. And, you know, when they were sort of trying to sell a deal to Turkey or to Greece, uh, you know, what was in their minds is this is how much money I'm going to make. And so the top chief salesman is going to go out there. He may be the CEO of the company. He's going to go out there and say, yeah, this is what we need to do. We need to get this deal. So I think that, you know, um, it just, it's the reward structure. It's the incentive structure. And we, we are, you know, dealing with CEO pay that is, you know, I think many people would agree that it is quite high, right? Astronomical. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so there is something to be said when you have, when you see people working at nonprofit organizations, for instance, and they're barely making, you know, ends meet when they're doing good and they should be actually be paying, being paid more than people who are, you know, selling other things that, you know, probably aren't necessarily adding uh, so much social value. I think there's something to be learned about this in two things. One is that if you look at a lot of the leaders that we, call, people we call leaders these days, we might want to wonder in grade school what grade they got in the work and play category together. <laughs> because um, clearly cooperation and leadership is, uh, is an important, um, important task uh, that we should all think about. Maybe they skipped kindergarten. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Let me, Essie, mm -hmm. do you agree with, does everybody on stage agree with this notion that if women were in more of the boardrooms, that if, I mean, we're all women up here, so let's address mm -hmm. the elephant in the room, right? Mm -hmm. Would women, uh, you're making a face. Why yeah. are you making a face? Because I don't love identity politics, and, you know, it was interesting last night at the debate, the four GOP contenders were asked um, to name some Hispanic Republicans that they would appoint to their cabinet or in, in, into their administration. And Romney ticked off a list of names, and then um, Newt Gingrich ticked off a list of names, and Rick Santorum ticked off. And Ron Paul was the only one who said, I'm not going to give you names. I would appoint the people who are most qualified. And that's the right answer. Um, I, I don't think any of us on this stage are successful because someone came up to us and said, I need to find you a leadership position, plucked us out of a crowd and put us into a leadership position. So while it's good to see, you know, 2010 was actually a banner year for, for women in politics, a lot of women running uh, for, for office, and it's good to see more women in the boardroom. That's, that's great, but I don't love the quota mongering, and I don't love the, uh, the idea that we need to push a, a, an identity block in, in, into the forefront. I think we should search for the most qualified people and hope that they rise to the top and do the best job. Okay, so let me uh, turn this on you. And so let's mm. say for the past few decades... I see how this is going to go. You know, and I'm, I'm very even-minded about I'm this. I'm used to it. It's okay. But, um, no, no, I'm actually very... <laughs> but let's say for, if you look at the past few decades and you look at, you know, Cornell University, other yeah. universities, and the makeup of the student body, it was probably predominantly male, right? right? It's actually moving predominantly female. Well, yeah. that's my point. I'm sorry. And so you see... Got ahead of myself. ...that elite educate educational institutions yeah. for decades have been, you know, uh, educating a field of many, many men. And that's why many, many men have gone into corporate America. So let's just say, if you were just to open the floodgates and let, you know, anyone who is best qualified to get in, probably what would happen is that you would have more female students. So we've actually, because I think that in general, they tend to test better. I was talking to 
you know, the dean of a, of, a, of a school who said, my goodness, one year we did open the floodgates and we just did it according to their, their grades and their stats and it was, we had 60% girls. We can't continue that. Right. So they actually tempered it down. But in some ways, if you think that we have how to balance it out and get more women into corporate America who are qualified, what if you actually just open the floodgates? You don't even have to do affirmative action for, for women in, in universities. And just you know, have another couple of decades where there's mostly women. You'd flood the market with, with very, very qualified women, and maybe they would rise to the top. Absolutely. <laughs> That's a free market solution. Yep. I like it. But wait, uh, but wait, Cheryl, let me say that uh, uh, two, two thoughts on that, which is that there is this question about what is the goal for women. I, I never, right now, uh, cor senior corporate uh, executives that are women, make, or women make about 14% of corporate executives. But there is this sort of notion that it should be 50-50, and it takes away from the fact that there are women who want to leave the workforce to raise their families. I mean, I have great, many great friends who are stay-at-home moms who do that. I am with Essie on this one, that you have to sort of <laughs> pick, pick the... <laughs> Pick the right person for the, pick mm. the right person for the job, and we have these incredible women leaders now that are I mean the president of Harvard, of Brown, of Yale are all women. Corporate America, there's plenty of examples at Pepsi and uh, well mm -hmm. Hewlett Packer was and uh, Xerox, Xerox. Right. are all women. <laughs> I think we spend a little too much time focusing on women. I have never had a piece of leadership advice that wouldn't apply equally to a man or a woman, with the exception of, if you're going to cry, make sure your office door is closed. I <laughs> because I think that women do tend, can be a little more emotional. But I, 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 I'm not such a women's, a women's person. I think we spend a little too much time focused on it. But mm -hmm. I think that the question was women, more women in the boardroom would make a, a difference or in the, in the conversation. Positions. But think about this, that diversity powers innovation. So that the, if you have different perspectives coming together to deal with issues, and um, you will have different points of view, different references, different accountabilities, different checks and balances. And when you have like minds all in the room together, then the idea that you might think outside of the box is pretty limited. And I, so I think that in that sense, do women make a difference or, or not? The, the reality is that having a diverse experience to draw from will make a difference. And there was, and even within your own experience, um, I was reading a, a, a friend of mine's thesis, and it looked at what would make great nonprofit leaders, and would they come from the business sector versus the um, nonprofit sector, which one you know, is more likely to be the better uh, leader. And her conclusion was it didn't really matter. What it mattered is how diverse the experience of was the leader. And if the leader was pushed out of his or her comfort zone more than, than just staying in one lane all the time, the likelihood that they had in, even within an individual, they would bring more experience and better leadership to the, to the organization. So, yeah. No, I totally agree. I think that, um, look, we are different. And, you know, I don't want to say that I'm exactly like a man. I mean, you know, hopefully I wasn't chosen wrongly because I was only a woman. Um, but I do think that we are different. And you always play to your strengths. You always play to your edge. And, you know, women are different from men. And I think that women in leadership positions does make a difference in many ways. It's not necessarily always good. It could be bad, but it makes a difference. It's a different, they, they um, lead differently. So for instance, if you look at uh, Secretary Clinton, and not all women lead alike either. So Secretary Clinton, I think that although she's done a, a very, very good job, she's logged a zillion miles, I mean, she's done a really good job uh, in encouraging the State Department. She, the morale is very good there. I think she's you know, protected her budget, and she's also uh, you know, done, given the challenge, she's done a good job on, on foreign relations, but I think the other thing that she has done that's made a difference is that she really has been a spokesman for women in the rest of the world. And that's something no other Secretary has, of State has done, even previous women. So it's not just the fact that she's a woman that she's doing this. And in the rest of the world, being a woman does count because I think that there is discrimination against women. We're lucky here in the U.S. that it's a, it's a lot better than in other places, but being a woman does hurt you in places, it, it, you know, it counts in other places, and if you can focus on the women in development, 
that does turn the tides. Let me say, yeah. I totally agree. I mean, yeah. I'm talking domestically, internationally, yeah. the way that the only way we are going to fix some of the intractable economic issues in the rest of the world is to get women employed. I mean, that Did you is, read her book? That is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes. But that is clearly, uh, when I mean, I mean here in America where we have come very far, you know, if you have 50% of a workforce that is not allowed to work, you're not going to get very far. And so I don't I mean agree. to make a joke. I mean, you wrote about that extensively, and you talked about moral leadership and the role of women in more, to tell us what you mean by moral well, leadership. Well, I think that um, it, it really sort of um, derives once a power has political, economic, and military leadership, with the, which the U.S. has achieved in a way that no other country has achieved, the next step really is to use that leadership for something, to make the, place, the world a better place. And I think that the U.S. in some times, in some places, occasions, has taken a good stand. I mean, you know, you can agree or disagree, but Obama did take a stand when it, you know, came to what, what you know, to Egypt and to the Middle East uh, on the democracy movement there. Uh, but in other cases, he, the U.S. has fallen short. Uh, so I think that, you know, you obviously have to pick your spots, but I think that the U.S. can do a little bit more on that front. And I just, if I can, I want to go back to Cheryl, because you were touching on talking about whether women should be, how we foster women in leadership roles. Ch diversity officers, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and this is a sticky subject, I know, but there, there are a lot of companies now that have chief diversity officers. Is that helpful? Does that, does that help women? Does it help people of color? Does it, or do we need more than that? Is it enough? Well, I mean, I think a, a, C, a chief diversity officer is a signal to the organization that the um, that the, the leadership is is comfortable with talking about diversity. However, I don't think that embodying that power in one person is far enough. First, you have to start off with bold leadership, leadership that's comfortable saying that diversity is part of our mission of what we're doing in the organization that is connected to whatever the organization's uh, bottom line is: engagement, money, profits, you know, whatever it is, influence. Um, and then you need what I call local vocal advocates, people who will drive that diversity mission through the organization in a very meaningful way. But if the company hasn't figured out what the d diversity is supposed to do, whether it's to, it's to, um, to, to uh, drive innovation, as I talked about, drive creativity, to gain perspectives beyond the normal perspectives that might gather together, then the organization doesn't really have a rallying force around diversity, and that's when the organization's efforts usually fall apart. So if you look at some of the organizations where diversity is you have to do this and not do that, those tend not to work when you offer something that I think is interesting of a, a way to customize it within the different areas of the organization and they can take ownership in a very meaningful way, then that diversity officer has something to work with. Can you give me an example? Or am I I'm putting you on the spot? Can I use the <laughs> Cornell example? Sure. Do you mind? What? Don't look at them. Yes, you can use it. <laughs> Charlie, <laughs> Charlie, incidentally. <laughs> okay. You can say anything. Right. Don't look over there. <laughs> Uh, I know, I, I mean, I, I'd like to use this because it is something that we're all touch on and I think it'll be very interesting and, and engaging. Um, instead of saying to um, all the different parts of the Cornell community, you have to do diversity this way or that way, giving um, the different uh, administrative uh, F, uh, areas. I was trying to fix it. The different administrative areas, the, the schools, uh, the staff, the, the different you know, parts of the, of, the, of the community, a menu of things to work on and uh, the identification of the resources of how to make those work gives this um, effort a lot more chances of success than had um, everyone in Day Hall said, this is what you have to do and this is the only way to measure success. So um, once you put uh, a way for people to own that diversity effort, and then understand how it's going to be measured and what the accountability structure looks like, you will probably have a better success ratio, uh, ratio than not. And I, and I say this because I've covered diversity for most of my career and, and have done a lot of work with a lot of different organizations and corporations around diversity. And I'm sorry to say, for many, for many of these organizations, the efforts did not uh, pan out because there was never any local ownership of the effort. It was something that the 
the boss said we had to do without a really understanding of how to get it done. I'm going to go back over to Essie. Mm -hmm. um, I bring up politics again. I was in Florida for the debate that we... Th why are you laughing? Because <laughs> I go to you on politics. Well, because that's your thing. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. That is your thing. You told me that the it other is. day. You said right. politics is my thing. You're right. Um, I was in Tampa. NBC sponsored a debate uh, on Tuesday. So I was in Tampa for that. And I went around and I, I was talking to Florida voters for a piece that we're doing for, for next week, for Monday. And I hope you'll all watch, please, because we need every viewer we can These get. Are great flags. Um, <laughs> I know. <right? laughs> nice segue there. But no, but here's the thing. We were talking to Florida voters, a lot of undecided voters, yeah. a lot of anger at Washington, at this yep. town. And a lot of sentiment, as you mentioned before, that just things just don't work. There's no unity. And you can't have leadership without unity. So instead of talking about the negative, though, my question is, how do we, how do we find unity? How, how do political leaders in this town come together? Where do you see us going? Is it possible? Please well, tell us something positive. Gosh, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this intractability that has sort of marked the last three plus years was both inevitable and not unique, not the first time uh, the, the House and the Senate or Republicans and Democrats have been at loggerheads or that there's been a, you know, a divisive kind of polarizing um, figure, whether that's Obama if you're on the right or Boehner if you're on the left. And Let's face it, these issues are galvanizing. They are serious. People are passionate about them. Whether it's a social issue or a fiscal issue, people are out of jobs. Um, and there is one thing the American people have zero sense of humor on, and that is unemployment. You can be as partisan and gimmicky as you want about a, a myriad of issues, but when you start politicizing unemployment, the American people put their foot down and get really, really angry. They want solutions on unemployment, and they want them now. They don't care who gets the credit. So what you're seeing, I think, is the natural state of politics. I mean, this happens from time to time. Not everyone is getting along, and let's work for the greater good, and that really rarely happens. But it's amplified, I think, by the fact that the economy is bad, unemployment is high, and people want action in ways that, that are more immediate than they do on almost every other issue out there. They can wait on an immigration policy. They waited for 20 years on health care reform. They will wait, but they have zero patience when it comes to jobs. So, Kathy, I, I'm going to ping pong over here because you live here, and we were talking on the phone the other day about this, that you see little examples of bipartisanship, if you will. Okay. People, uh, so there's mm, there's lots of examples of, of roadblocks and of lack of leadership on, on, for the 535 people on the Hill. But there's a lot of examples in Washington of people who do great. And it, it's frustrating sort of as a native Washingtonian that you don't see it. Most people who work for the federal government are very, very committed civil servants who really do care deeply about this country. You will not find, thank you, here for them. You will not find harder people, uh, people who work harder than on the Hill. If you talk to AAs on the Hill, legislative, you know them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're there 100 hours a week, ignoring their families yep. to, to a large degree. <laughs> yeah. Same with people in the White House. They care deeply. They might care too deeply. But um, it, there are, you know, I happen to live uh, in between sort of one of a really well-known Republican lobbyist and a really well-known Democrat. Mm -hmm lobbyist who are all they're together they're at each other's houses they they you know share parties they're at the same fundraisers and that's true of a lot there used to be more of that ted kennedy was great at inviting people mm. over for dinner if we had a little more alan simpson ted kennedy uh esque relationships things would be a lot better but uh, in Washington, there, there is on the next level down a great sense of community, a great sense of caring among uh, Senate and Hill staffers, among federal employees. It's not as politicized. It's just mm -hmm. somehow or other there's a real lack of leadership in that 
that, that, that 535. Is there mm -hmm. some secret to getting them all to work together, to getting people to pull together on, on jobs? I mean, I think you're right. That yeah, there is, is the there is, there is a secret. There is a secret. When the company comes to cri when the country comes to crisis, they get together. Look what happened after 9-11, right? We had legislation within two weeks passed to set up a fund that was unprecedented. It was full to, to, to pay victims. It was something that it had ethical problems written all over it. Uh, I saw Ken Feinberg, the Pazar. I had breakfast with him yesterday. People came to him. Wait, I'm sorry, did you say you had breakfast with him yesterday? Yes, with Ken Feinberg. The, the, he said, people came to him and said, um, my brother died in Oklahoma City. Why don't I get paid? My father died in the first World Trade Center in 93. I didn't get a check, but we came together, we did that. We came together for TARP. Paulson and Geithner worked well together in a transition. You might disagree with TARP, you might think it's a bad idea, they might not have implemented it well. They came together, they got something, something passed when we were on the brink of economic failure. Uh, I mean, there's m examples and examples, but it seems to be only when the country really is screaming and yelling about one, one big issue. Which I don't know why it doesn't happen on the deficit, because everybody knows that that's a mess and we can't get it passed there. Mm -hmm. I think a big part of this is that how, you know, it's, it's kind of like back on the voters and how we choose our leaders. Um, I think that you were saying that things may have to change, Cheryl. One of the issues is that picking leaders that actually understand economics is probably more important now than ever before. But if you ask most of the uh, elect uh, people, the voters, whether they, what they know about their uh, candidates' understanding of the um, the real issues of job development, business development, economics, you would probably, they wouldn't know. They would kind of know the sound bites that went along with what they said about these areas, but do they know how much their understanding is? And so when you watch um, some of the, uh, you know, like when they were grilling the auto leaders, um, you could tell that some of the people in the room really actually understood what was happening with the auto industry, and you could Something. see mm -hmm. that there was a lot hearings. of people who didn't, yeah. yes, the, the initial hearings, didn't understand it. And so I would almost want to send a lot of our uh, elected officials to summer school and get... <laughs> yeah. No, 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 hold on. Let me, right. hey, let me take that, though, because I think, I, I, am, I, am, I think, I don't know, it's a question for the audience, maybe the problem is the other way, because I have thought about this as well, and I checked the stats on this. Our, our elected officials now are way more educated. I fear saying this at, you know, in front of this great Cornell University sign, but 70% 70, uh, 70 of the Senate has not a college degree, but has a higher oh, than yeah. college degree, mm -hmm. a master's or a PhD, and that's 50% on the Hill side. Maybe we need more Harry S. Truman's who, who didn't have a college degree, but mm -hmm. some people who have some grit some uh, real life some, I hear people going, oh, come on. No, no, but I don't mean Harry S. Truman, but I mean um, we we're vote for people who, are st who are, uh, show real leadership skills and grid instead of looking into uh, their, their education well, yeah. or taxes. Well, I think, they're, I think they're educated. I'm just not sure if they are knowledgeable about these issues. Yeah, 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 yeah I, I can't. <laughs> well, and actually, it's really I can't interesting. disagree. There's a problem up there. I just don't know what it is. I think it's very interesting, and to your point, I mean, there, there is a difference between, you know, a degree and real-life experience, whether that's leading a company or hiring and firing or whatever the, you know, the, the discipline is. And I think one perfect example of that, at least on the GOP side, Mitt Romney is running as a private sector candidate, which I think marks the first time in history that someone has run away from their executive experience. The governorship used to be the upper echelon, unimpeachable qualification for a president to be. And here you have Mitt Romney going out saying, don't say the G word. Let's talk about the fact that I have been in the private sector for 25 years and ignore the fact that he would have been in the public sector had he been elected more often. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's fascinating. And I think a real sign of the times that you have a governor who is saying, let's look at my business skills and not my executive experience. I'm going to pick up on, uh, it, you teed this up perfectly because you're talking about education and, and we have that, that Twitter and Facebook audience out there somewhere and they're sending in their questions. So someone wrote, can higher education do anything to better prepare leaders for the challenges that we're talking about up here on stage? So what can Cornell, what can 
other bodies of higher education, institutions of higher education do, Cheryl, I'll put it to you, well, to help right. solve well, the crisis. I think there leadership. are a number of things that we can do. I think that there is a crisis in education on several fronts right now. Um, one is that what brought America to the place where it is, you know, the global leadership, is that we had education for the masses. I mean, that's, I know, you know, for everybody. Uh, we didn't really care whether you got, you know, a, a Cornell education or you got, you know, a community college education. In fact, what really makes a country tick and elevates the level of a country's, you know, uh, economic prowess is better education at the community college level because you just need to get everybody educated. And I think that we're dipping now on all of the global statistics. And we're like, instead of number one in terms of, you know, the best educated, the highest grad number of graduates from high school and from college, we're slipping to number 15, number 20. I mean, we're way down there. So I think there's been a failure there. Um, in And, you know, <coughs> higher education can also help with secondary education. So it's not just that you know, the, the higher education institutions can sit back and say, well, that's secondary education's fault. Um, and higher education can play a role in trying to figure out what is the best way to really bring, again, bring us back to mass education. Are there literally courses that should be taught that aren't being, I mean, I don't even, I haven't looked at the earlier. syllabus in a million years, so I don't, I don't know, know really what's yeah. being taught. Cornell was um, where I, I think I really cemented learning how to, to be a leader um, in the sense that it was a place where you were able to um, have an organization. There was always some funding available. There was always, uh, I mean, reality is that and the fact that I am on a trustee board is amazing to me. When I was in, in uh, the university, I had a newspaper and a magazine. And sometimes I took the administration to task a lot in that. I was an independent um, uh, publications. It wasn't part of the Cornell Sun. It wasn't part of anything. And it was amazing to me that there was always a dialogue that was going on. So if you have organizations, even more important than I think classes, where um, they really look at these organizations as important to um, helping develop leaders, sometimes supporting them while they're learning and doing is as important as any class. So you hit, you, you, you know, during, in any kind of organization, you have to do a budget, manage people, and those kinds of things. And I think that universities have to take some of these student groups seriously in the sense of helping to look at the leadership. I know PCCW does a lot to make sure that the leadership of wi women that not only uh, lead women's organization, but there's an encouragement to lead um, co-ed organizations as well, so that you don't have see that drop off in junior and senior year that you see in women leaders in a lot of campus. Mm -hmm. And I meant to say the course catalog, not I'm sitting here thinking, <laughs> it's not a syllabus, it's a course catalog. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> for those of you who are going, what is she talking about? Um, Kathy, mm -hmm. did Cornell make you a better leader? No, it's, it's funny, I was thinking about this, we were talking about leadership, and it's, you know, it's this great field of study, is leadership born or is it learned? I think Cornell gave me the opportunity to be a better leader. I don't think it made me a better leader. That being said, I was thinking about it, I asked my assistant and several other people in the office, hey, did, did, I didn't even know it was gonna come in as a Twitter question, but this, did your college help prepare you for leadership? And they said, they, across the board, they said, and, uh, my high school did. My high school talked more about leadership there was more clubs, more activities. I think everybody feels a little lost in college. You get there and you're trying to figure out which way is this. It takes you sort of two or three years to get settled before you know, you know, there's a good lunch at the Big Red Barn and you don't have to eat at Willard Hall every day. <laughs> the, <laughs> but I mean, who realizes that before? I, I don't know, is that still true? Is that, it? I mean, it took, Walsh you know. had a really good lunch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, the, so I don't know, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how you teach leadership other than provide people the opportunity to get involved in a lot of things on campus. And the more things you get involved in, the more likely you are to grow to be a leader. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I was an art history major. Um, not using that at all today. But not, you know, to say that it wasn't a fun experience, and it was, I loved it. But, you know, no one on this panel talked about the class they took that, you know, gave them this opportunity for success. I worked at the Cornell Sun 
uh, the three years that I was at Cornell, and that was where I learned not only what I wanted to do for a living, but probably the only time in my life that I'll ever get to tell other people what to do. Um, I was an editor there. I don't know about that. Oh, really? no. <laughs> absolutely not. No. I will be taking direction for the rest of my life, but I was an editor there, and... Wait until you have kids. A, a, yeah. <laughs> That was a, a leadership experience for me that changed the course of, of my life. And I think, you know, when you talk about the college experience, so many people focus on the curriculum. And so much of college is what happens when you're not in class. And that doesn't mean that, you know, the parties and all of that is the experience, but it's those opportunities to find out who you are, to find out what your career should be, to, to to experience those leadership pangs and, 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 and understand what that feels like and work with other people and, and boss other people around, in my case, which I did really well. Um, that, that experience, you know, and, and even today, I couldn't tell you who I sat next to in art history class, but I run into people from the sun everywhere. I can tell you, Andrew Ross Sorkins at CNBC and Mickey Ravkins at GQ, and I mean, all the people that I worked with are, are in this business working you know, with me today. Those are the experiences, and it won't be the sun for everyone, obviously, but those are the experiences I think that you take beyond the classroom, beyond graduation, and into your, your future lives. The professors out there. Are there professors here? There are professors <laughs> cringing Sorry, right professor. now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Cheryl, someone else wrote in, and I wasn't, I wasn't going to go through this because I didn't know if it would be of interest, but someone wrote in on Twitter and said, how did the panelists make the transition from what they did at Cornell to where you are now? <laughs> so I think it might be instructive. And I'll, uh, let's go back to SE and start there because you're the most... Recent grad. I'm sorry I can to remember keep, it. Sorry to keep <laughs> saying that. <laughs> so you can remember. Everyone else can think while you're talking. Um, well, again, I worked at The Sun, and I knew that I wanted to be a writer. I didn't know that I wanted to be a political writer. I just wanted to write. So I got writing jobs out of college, uh, a bunch of different kinds. I worked at um, for travel magazines. I worked for the Bond Buyer, which was a municipal bond daily. Well, that was a mistake. Um, <laughs> I had zero <laughs> business working there. Um, and then I ended up at the New York Times for eight years. And at that point, I uh, decided I wanted to write a book about politics. And uh, I also went back to school and got a graduate degree at the same time. And uh, that sort of ushered me into this political writing career. I literally like wandered in by mistake. I feel lucky that they let me stick around here. Um, it just happened to be timing. and sort of the, the political climate of the time was right and, and uh, you know, hard work. <laughs> right. You did write a book. I mean, there's yeah. a little hard work in there. Sh yeah. Cheryl, same question. I'll just go down the line because right. I no, think I, people are yeah. curious the link between, because you are in a leadership position now. You're, you're, you're right. I, I totally, I mean, my life has been so eclectic and strange. I mean, I think that probably the only link that I had to journalism when I was at Cornell was I was a pre-med history major, and I was just moving into the history department. I was talking to a professor, and I said, what am I supposed to do with history? Because he was trying to convince me to be a history major. He goes, well, you know, you can go into journalism. And at the time, of course, I was pre-med. I said, oh, he's nuts. Why would I ever want to go into journalism? <laughs> <laughs> but life is strange. And so I ended up in journalism, of course, and that was a wonderful profession. It's a great... And so history does prepare you for, uh, for, um, from, for journalism. Um, but I think also... Uh, just what Cornell did for me was that it gave me an intellectual awakening. I mean, I just had great professors at Cornell, I mean, amazing professors who just opened my mind and allowed me to be more open-minded about things. So I was open-minded about journalism, and then I went moved to other things. I was in banking. I mean, I've just done a lot of things, and I think that open-mindedness is really what I've taken from Cornell. I think um, as it, I knew I wanted to be a journalist from my freshman year running these two publications. So what I learned, though, is that you can affect change through the media. When, um, when we wrote about things, we did get calls from people. We did engage in dialogue with people. Sometimes we didn't do it in the most diplomatic way. We still got respect from, from the people that we were taking to task. And so it's been important for me to understand and, and use the media to help um, build uh, understanding around different things. And I think that um, that has also, um, I think I, I learned a lot of compassion at uh, 
Cornell through others. I was meeting people with different circumstances that I had. I grew up in a pretty suburban, middle-class life, and, and I, when I got to Cornell, my roommate was from a rural area that in New York State, which I didn't even know New York State had rural areas because all I knew was New York City. Um, so mm -hmm. it did give me, um, I met more international people than I ever did, and it, mm -hmm. it definitely gave me a compassion to help others and to work with others, which is now blossoming itself in my new career choice in philanthropy. Um, I, I think you, Kate, you and I were talking about this earlier. Some people graduate and they just have this sense of this is this is what I want. And then other, I, th other, I say other, but I think most people graduate and really don't have a great idea what they want to do. So I, I I fell into the great you know ma ma um, unwashed masses. I went to work for a think tank because you know academia thinking thoughts seemed seemed good. <laughs> um, it was pretty. It was slow paced. I, I, I had been history and government. And that led me to some campaigns. It wasn't until I was sort of in my mid-20s that it, I figured out that what I really liked was business. And I had worked for a year for a, for a company and, and discovered that, boy, those accounting guys in the corner, they're, they're interesting to me. Uh, what are they doing? What, is the, what, is the pro, what does profit margin mean? What is, and I had had, I had been pretty strong in math. That led me uh, into consulting, into business, but life, weird things happen in life. I ended up, I, I ran, you know, I spent five years uh, running Easy Pass, working for Michael Huerta, who's now head of the FAA, uh, and, you know, a toll chick, you know, I mean, that's what we would always, the girls, very few girls in transportation, you know, working on toll systems. Anyone who's driven through Route 1 on the Jersey Turnpike, I've walked that as a construction site many, many times. Uh, so it wasn't, even though I grew up in a journalism family, it was business, and then I ended up uh, the old-fashioned way you know, in, 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 my, in our family business. I consider myself more of a business person than anything, anything I else. I didn't know that. I thought you were journalism background. Did you get an MBA? Uh, no, I got a master's in uh, public administration, an, an MPA. So it would, it, life has, has, as Cheryl said, eclectic corners that take you places, but if you work hard, which I think most people do, mm -hmm. and I wanted to say from the opening shot, there is a guy <laughs> over here in the front row, I'm going to point out, who came up to me before the panel. He's a junior in a high school here in Washington who writes on his school paper, wants to go to Cornell, talked his way in to come here today. <laughs> it's, it's Friday night. I'm sure there's other places he'd rather be. If that's not a hardworking guy, Seriously. Charlie, you should get him an interview. <laughs> um. <laughs> now I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Where are we going? <laughs> I actually, you work hard, you do well, you that's how you that, end up. You know, it's, it, I actually kind of say that every time, because I get those phone calls too. How did you end up at NBC? And it's not, it wasn't exactly a straight line. It took a long... How did you get there? Well, thank, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, mine's a long story, but basically WVBR. Uh, which is the voice of the Big Red, which is still exists. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, still exists on campus, slightly off campus. Um, when I was there, it was on Linden Avenue in that really nice building. Does anyone know? <laughs> it's still there, right? You live on Linden Avenue. It's right there. Um, I worked for WVBR. I, I got into it thinking that I was going to be a radio DJ and ended up in the news department by accident, honestly. Went there with my dorm mate, and she and I were going to be DJs. <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm covering the Ithaca City Council and loving it, and j went from there into radio, and went to grad school along the way, couldn't get a radio job, so I went to re grad school, and then after that, um, went to CNN as a producer and a booker, and then decided I'd want to ask the questions on TV rather than being behind the scenes, and went out to New Mexico. I told you it's a long story. I worked my way back. <laughs> worked my way back from New Mexico, Atlanta, Atlanta, D.C. I was here for five years covering the Hill, covering the White House, and then moved to New York for Good Morning America and now for NBC. So that's kind of my trajectory. But, um, you know, it's what you said about the sun in my case, too. I got a lot of great experience at VBR, mm. but I also was a communication major, and I have to give some kudos to mm. the comm department <laughs> for a lot of the coursework that I had because it really did help you know, prepare me. I, there's a news writing class that I will never forget that still, to this day, I, I think back to in my head when I'm writing stories. So, anyway, that's my brief story. Um, it's enough about, it's not about me, you are the panelists here. <laughs> so, um, I want to ask about, I want to change subjects if I can, because Cornell just won this really big bid. It's gotten a lot of attention where I live in New York City. 
if you don't know, <laughs> probably everyone in the room knows this, but they just want to bid uh, against other universities to build a brand new applied sciences campus in New York. Uh, and this is a really big deal. This is a, a huge donation came in. It's going to be a big deal, big campus. What would you panelists tell Cornell leaders as they envision this and prepare to build this campus? What what advice, if I may be so bold, what advice would you give the leaders of Cornell in terms of what to do, what not to do? Uh, you're looking at me quizzically. I won't start with you, then I'll go, <laughs> so, I would, I'll go this way. I, I would say Kathy. clone Chuck Feeney first. <laughs> <laughs> would be the, the, number, the, number, the, number, the number one thing. I mean, it, it, is, a, it is a great... It, 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 is a, it is a great thing for Cornell. I think it presents some challenges as well, having, having a dual campus. So be strategic about uh, what is there. Uh, you know, uh, the classic undergrad education, um, you know, I think Cornell will always be Cornell. I, I hear there are people that think, oh, Cornell's moving to New York. That's insane. I mean, that is insane. Cornell, Ithaca is always going to be a great campus. But uh, this gives Cornell quite an advantage to find people jobs, to have access to a great, the great brain trust that's in, that's in New York, and to help be part of a redevelopment of an area that needs redevelopment. I think it's exciting. Michelle, you talk so much about educa global education. Right. I imagine this fits right in with what I'm well, guessing I, you think needs to um, happen. I did say this uh, before and I, uh, to some of the people at Cornell, and I really do feel that this is an opportunity. It is transformative for Cornell. And I do think it's an opportunity, if you look at what Schumpeter says about creative destruction, um, Cornell has a chance to build something very organically from the very beginning. And it is a moment where all of you, each one of you, if you have a point of view, if you have a suggestion, send it in, because I really think that they can build this right now. I mean, it's like taking, you know, it's the, it's the most advanced that we can create, uh, that we can be in creating a new institution from scratch. So let's get it right and let's do it fabulously well. So each one of you, please think about it. I think I would push again that, you know, diversity powers innovation. And I think the fact that there was such a coalition of diverse people that were pulled together to help, you know, get this initiative uh, passed. And I think the leadership of Cornell reached out in many, many ways. And I think there are a lot of uh, leadership in our midst of, uh, in this tech area, you know, science area. And so I also um, think that the strength of this will be how we leverage all that we are to bring this to bear. And also connecting into the the one thing that I would love to see, it was brought up uh, last week at the um, uh, Pan-Asian New Year Festival uh, that CAAA put on. Uh, one of the local politicians talked about connecting into the uh, public schools. I think this is a very visible um, uh, and significant nod to the importance of STEM and getting uh, younger people involved in science and technology and engineering and mathematics and getting them not at just the high school level but getting, bringing it down so they start getting involved in fourth grade so they get the math and science they need to be able to get into a Cornell. So um, we hope that, that we make that connection strong and, and really bring out some interesting programs that the, the public schools can take advantage of. Yeah, I mean, well, as Cornellians, you know, it's, it's hard. Ithaca is not an easy place to get to. So it's, it's always nice to see Cornell expanding its reach beyond, you know, Lake Cayuga. Um, it's, it's hard to get to. We were talking earlier. I am on an, another board at Cornell. They have meetings every winter. I can't go um, always. And whether it's Cornell in Qatar or Cornell in New York City now or Cornell... Um, you know, ac across the country, um, that's, that expansion of reach is something all of us look for. This event, this alumni event where you are all here in one place is a perfect example of how we live beyond graduation and, and extend our experience out into the world and out into, uh, you know, years after we, we leave. So I, I think that's a, a huge benefit for all of us in the Cornell community. We only have about five more minutes, so I, I could, because there are drinks waiting, in case you didn't know. So, um, so just quickly, I, do, I, I just have one more, and this is sort of a big, broad topic, but President Obama today 
uh, I emailed all of you about this earlier. President Obama was in Michigan today talking about affordability and access to education, to, to higher education. And he brought it up in the State of the Union, if you saw the State of the Union the other night. He's got some proposals. Um, obviously, they're, they're his Democratic proposals, haven't moved forward yet. But today he was talking about giving more federal grant money to colleges that contain tuition, uh, the rise in tuition. So universities that perform well on not having tuition go up and up and up will actually get more federal grant dollars. What do we think about that? What do we think about affordability? I mean, I'm saving already for my six and my nine-year-old in case they want to go to Cornell. I'm oh. dead serious. I, I think that's a great idea. I, mean, I, I don't see how you cannot like it. The question is, is how do you implement it and where do you get the funds to do it? But I do think making it more affordable and reaching out to more people, we need mass education. We need education for everyone, not just the people who can get into Cornell. You're on the board. You're on the board. Can, can, I mean, I don't even understand how, how it works. Can, we, can tuition be how contained? Can, can the growth be contained? It's difficult to contain the growth. You know, uh, growth has, has some funding responsibilities to it. And so, unfortunately, I think um, we will see tuition increases whether, you know, over the years. We try not to make them for just doing them for doing them safe. But I think what's most important is that the universities, and Cornell is one of them, making a bigger commitment to make sure that this, the school is affordable to more populations than who can naturally pay for them. And so um, that's where <coughs> philanthropy becomes really important because we want to be able uh, to be that school that any student can, can learn. But it, it, um, it's, it, it, for certain schools with certain growth factors, Tuition increase is going to be a reality. The, real, the other end of that is how do we help those who deserve to be here afford to be here? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> um, sure, we'd like to make college more affordable. That said, I'm not sure everyone should go to college. Um, we are a nation of thinkers. We don't build anything anymore. I thought it was a striking sort of disconnect in the State of the Union when the president said we need a return to manufacturing and everyone needs to go to college. I don't know who's working in the factories if we're all in school. We need more, as you said earlier, community colleges that can better service people, that are more affordable, that are better quality schools. We need a return to vocational education. I haven't seen a trade school in, in years. Um, we need to be teaching people how to learn skills, marketable skills, in addition to, you know, the intellectual scholarship that we, we all benefited from. That's, that's great. But um, maybe a return to manufacturing would be Essie, eased along the way if we weren't all in school. Essie, if you return to manufacturing or go, go into manufacturing, you need a college degree that's not sitting there sewing <laughs> on a it's button. Not true. This is the computer robotics. This is uh, uh, supply chain management. This is a, a lot of education is required. And there's a lot of trade schools, and there should be more community colleges. A lot colleges. of education is required for certain, for certain jobs. But a return to manufacturing, factories are shutter, shuttering their doors, not because they don't have enough highly qualified robotics trained. You know, but uh, you can't tie factories to edu manufacturing to education. I mean, you can't separate manufacturing sure and can. education. Sure no, you can. can. Now it's getting really juicy. <laughs> <laughs> we managed we to need keep to stop. it. We need to do this over cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> Is it time for cocktails? I think we've gone over. I was just checking I my think phone. It's we've time gone over for wine. I want to. I want to um, thank everyone. Are you going to thank everyone? Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you, Kate, S. E. Cheryl. Kathy and Cheryl for a thought-provoking and very entertaining um, <laughs> conversation. And I really want to invite everybody to continue the conversation outside with a lot of wine. And then um, thank you all to our Facebook um, audience that joined us all the way from Australia also. And at 7.30, please join us to root for Cornell versus Colgate um, at the hockey game. Uh, in the lobby bar, so we hope to see you there too. Uh, thank everybody for attending today. Wait, don't get up yet, don't get up yet. <laughs>